Everybody looks so happy. I know. Photos of victory are just the best, aren't they? <laughs> this is so, so true. <laughs> Photos of defeat. I wouldn't mind seeing the other side of this. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Flipping over to the Oilers. <laughs> I don't feel bad feelings about the Oilers. What is up, everybody? And welcome into the Denver Sports Podcast, where we talk about Denver sports and all of the things going on in the Denver sports world. And there's really only one thing going on in the Denver sports world right now. I know there's these other things, guys. There's these footnotes in the world of Denver right now. But there is a headline event that is going on, and that is, of course, the... Colorado Avalanche are headed to the Stanley Cup Finals and here to help me talk about them. I brought in my co-host of the show, Ryan Koningsberg. Go Avs. <laughs> wow. That was a deep breath. A very deep breath. But I didn't really think about that one, huh? Yes. <laughs> you know what, though? I agree with you. Go Avs. I haven't said it in like... At least uh, I there hasn't been a game in so long already. So <laughs> you don't wake what, up every morning, look in the mirror, and and say that <laughs> you got to get your rest in, man. It's gonna be uh, yeah. you know, it's you're gonna use a lot of energy once these parties. I'm begin. gonna Russell Wilsonize it and just finish every sentence of <laughs> go abs. <laughs> Nice. Um, <laughs> it's going to get old quick. <laughs> the the guest of today's show, but also the star of today's show, is, of course, everybody's favorite Avs fan and analyst. It's none other than Rudo. I don't even know his real name. It's just Rudo. Rudo? Yeah. I, it's just Rudo. That's, uh, that's it. <laughs> it's a, you have to be very famous to only have one name. Uh, you have to be very good at what you do. Nene. <laughs> Nene like that. I like that that's your first example. Well, that's that's Nene. like Nene Kaka. is to the NBA as Rudo is to DNVR. That seems about right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I actually think this is a perfect panel given the topic. I mean, the topic of today is like, you know, the guide to be the bandwagoners, bandwagoners guide to the Colorado Avalanche, because we know that anytime there is a title run going on, every single round you go deep, people are jumping on. They're getting a little bit excited. And we've seen this here at DNVR. I mean, Rudo, you could talk about it, but you guys have a big community. You guys like the apps people, they come to DNVR for apps coverage, but that group <laughs> just keeps growing with every win. I mean, what's it been like watching the city kind of catch this abs fever, but also watching you guys in particular grow that over this last two months? Yeah, it's it's been wild in the playoffs where every single team you face, it's any other team that like slightly dislikes that team is like, okay, I'm rooting for the abs. Really? Now. Yeah. We're the good guys? Yeah, we are the good guys. Oh, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Just not that. the Blues fans or Oilers fans. I, I don't even think Oilers fans are that mad about it. There's there's like that salty sect of them. That there's like, I didn't realize Nathan McKinnon was a dirty player. Yeah. Like, I think that. Oh, like that. there's nothing worse than that. Like, I judge a fan base by how much they complain about those also, things. Also, I know we laugh about this, but like, he won a Lady Bing. <laughs> <laughs> the Blues fan base genuinely doesn't like us. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I like being hated. <laughs> Well, what an eight and two in the playoffs against the Blues in the last two years. That's uh, I eight and one. Eight and one. Yeah. No, no they lost two. They got, they? They lost two. Oh, eight, yeah. Yeah, eight yeah, and two. You're right. You're right. Sorry. Hey, don't it's, let it's me tell 12, you all the details about it. It's twelve and three, all time. Really? Yeah. Their other their series back in two thousand three, two thousand two. I think one of those. Get on our level, St. Louis. Also, four and one. Edmonton is even worse against the Avs in yeah. the playoffs. Uh, they've only played twice. I think. So less possibility yes. for total wins, yes. but I think they're eight but is it true now. though that I mean this is a kind of a good first question because I didn't know that oh one of the things I was going to say is the reason I think this is such an interesting topic is that I am a bandwagoner and that I've always loved Let's the apps go. like I always love all of the Colorado sports teams it's just that I'm not always like you know I'm skin deep into a, the Avalanche for example but now that you're on a playoff run like I think I've watched all but one of the games when I was out of town so like this is one where you like you get into it RK you are an Avs fan. Not an yep. Avs analyst, but you are an Avs super fan. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect way of describing it. it the, it's funny because I always say, like, hockey is my best sport for me to just be a dumb fan. <laughs> right, right. Like, right. I just want to get drunk and yell and wave pom poms. Like, that, like, in, it's funny because I watch every avalanche post game show now and i'm like stop you guys are making me too smart of a hockey fan i'm like sitting down here being like i don't know about this third line like maybe they need a shit and i'm like this is dumb i just want to just yell and scream but um yeah i mean i've i was truly hooked in 01 uh and and never really looked back and yep. you know for me like the abs were so dominant when we were kids yeah that it became um, so, it was too too much too soon. Yeah, that it was so hard to go right. through that that period. You didn't which, know any better. Yeah, right? <laughs> it was like wait, it's possible for the abs to not be amazing, <laughs> and so like, but 
you have to go through the down to enjoy the up. And so like, I'm, I'm almost thankful that it hasn't just been straight success forever because it gave me a whole new found appreciation. Like that Nashville series, how many years ago was that? Uh, uh, when they would the be game 82. five years ago now. Yeah. So like five years ago, um, I remember when they clinched and they were four. going to the playoffs. I like, it was decently early in Allie and I's relationship. And I was like, no, like we have to go. <laughs> we're to going. A game. Like, <laughs> playoff <laughs> hockey is like nothing else, you know? And like now like we go to as many as we possibly can. So, um, that, but yeah, I, I'm diehard fan. I like to draw the line right there. And then of course, Rudo, an analyst that have, has been doing this, but I want to go to your point here about 96 and 2001, right, right off the bat, you get some championships. I feel like in all sports, if you're an expansion team or if you're a new sports league or what have you, I feel like that first five years almost sets the tone for what kind of franchise you're going to be. If you win early, it's like, okay, because I think of the Avs as a successful hockey. Like, yeah. The Avs are, to me, a premier hockey team. Would you agree with that? Um, Organization, I should say. Uh, historically, yeah. Look, national media has always never been the most on top of Colorado sports in general, yeah, yeah. I would say. Uh, but absolutely, there is, you know, every time people bring up the apps, they're like, oh, it's Forsberg, Sackick, right. Ray Bork, Rob Blake, all these, it of course, Patrick you. Waugh. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, like... And it, it's a weird situation because it's almost something that this Avs team is fighting now because it's like, look, we're as good as those guys were back then is, is the point that McKinnon, Ranton, and McCarr are all trying to prove right. right now. But that's a cool thing. Like, you know, teams like the Lakers or Celtics have this too where every new generation, as great as they are, they'll be like, yeah, but they're not as good as the 80s one until you finish your you career and then it, you're in the club. Sure, but, the, but this version of the Avs actually has a chance to be that good. <laughs> I, I, I know, but it's great. Honestly, I come from this from another angle because I'm covering the Nuggets where there's not a good steep <laughs> history. So you can be like, hey, man, they've had as much success as anyone, which is to say not much. But when you do have that one, there is, I think there's something almost quaint or cool about the idea of it doesn't matter how great you are. You have to win to be in oh, the top absolutely. level of the club and they're now on that door. But I say that to say that the coasts in, in America, they're just, they always will have the prestige, but there is in every sport like St. Louis Cardinals to me are a prestigious baseball team when you talk about sure you know this or that or dallas cowboys or something like this in football where they beat the coast you know or they join that club and i feel like the avs to me at least are in that that group too where i think about like the red wings are there the avs are there the penguins are there like i don't know the prestige teams yeah I, all of those are fair fair assessments it's it, and look the avs have arguably had in, in my opinion, the greatest moment in North American sports history was the Ooh. 01 Cup win for Ray Bork. Oh. Uh, so that the definitely... Anniversary today. Yeah. Definitely helped cement them, I think, as, as, a, as a team that everyone knows who they are. We'll right. put it that way. Yeah. Um, but it, it's good to see them starting to garner back a lot of the, a lot of the newer bandwagon fans. It, it's good to have you back. I think it's it's similar to the Broncos in the sense it's not quite to that level because they just haven't been around nearly as long. Yeah. But it's like the Broncos had sustained enough sustained success to demand respect. Yeah. You know, and ever since then, like the NFL legitimately loves the Broncos. Right. Like they want the Broncos to be good. They want to put the Broncos on national TV. They want all those things. And I think the NHL is similar with the Avs. Like, especially when they're fun the NHL is invested in promoting the avalanche because right. it's like, this is a great franchise that has a lot of history and yep. a lot of sustained success. Yep. Do you think, is it weird to say that also I think people associate Colorado with cold and For so sure. that yeah. there's like something to it's, it's definitely fair with the hockey connection there. Like yeah. Tampa Bay has been good for a few years. I always am just like, this is the weirdest thing. The Tampa Bay is not a hockey town. Even if they have great fans, it's like, it's, 90 degrees for 90 percent of the year <laughs> someone on the broncos podcast the other day said if you could move any sports franchise what would you move and i said i would move every hockey team south of denver north of denver yeah, yeah right that denver is the most southern <laughs> yeah, you most can't team. go below this <laughs> <That's such> a, <laughs> i i you know what it's a good rule um i want to start here because we're learning about the abs now like i want uh, this is the cool thing about a city is the city i always say sports bring you together and no more is that true than when a team is in a, a title run and yep. like rocktober was the best example yep. i think ever of this because it's not a rockies town or it's not a baseball town rocktober every person on earth was a rockies <laughs> fan i feel like right now we're seeing 
the world has changed a little bit, but I see more interest in abs from oh, just ordinary absolutely. people than, than I have probably in the last 20 years. And that's what's cool about it. So tell me if my first question is, if you could give one word to describe this abs team, like you just want to like, who are they? What's the one word or maybe one phrase that you would say, this is their identity or this is what makes them them? Uh, should I, should I take the overconfident route or should I take the enjoy it route? Give me both, baby. Yeah, give me, into your head. yeah, the first one, the, the first word one. that came into my head was dominant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dominant. That they, this, you could genuinely make, genuinely make an argument. This is the best team the Colorado Avalanche have ever put together. They set their franchise record for points in the regular season. Without even trying the last week. Without even last two weeks, two they weeks, went like yeah. one in six. I'm yeah, pretty sure yeah. one, one made a couple, one, yeah, maybe. an overtime loss in there. Uh, and then you get into the playoffs, and they are currently twelve and two. Uh, which, by the way, the record ever in the playoffs is going sixteen and two. So still, still it's on, on the, the table, board. On yeah, the table. still on the board. Uh, it's. It's weird because it is reminiscent of those 96, those 01 teams, those great, great teams, but it's built in a different way. And, and maybe for me, I'm older, I can appreciate this a little bit more, but this team is genuinely electric when right. it comes to fun. The, all of the players on this team can do amazing things, and, and it's not the – you're close to the same age as me – You probably grew up with a slower pace a little bit of yeah, dead puck yeah. era hockey that is not this hockey team at all they at any moment they can flip the switch and do something that makes you go whoa the word i would have used is electric there yeah. you go um, <laughs> and it, it that's what i think makes this really easy to bandwagon them it's so obvious i i strong agree with this by the way it's so obvious when you turn on the game how good they are how special they are the level of top tier talent that they have on the team you know we joke about this on the bets podcast but I, it's kind of true like we just say like the abs are the only team in the playoffs that scores legitimate goals like <laughs> everyone else like and the abs got a couple lucky ones too in that in right. the end of that edmonton series but everyone else just like slams it at the net and like bounces off a few people yeah, and, yeah. like the abs are doing like you know, Macar's picking corners and just that you see them and you're like, Oh, they're it's like, you know, the beautiful game, you yeah, know, they're yeah. cycling the puck and just putting amazing shots on net and awesome moves, like and all that stuff. It's easy to be confident in a team right that like that, right? You look at the blues series and you're like, they have to bounce a puck off three players for it to go in the <laughs> yes. net. Like if they beat you like that, they beat you, I guess. Yes, <laughs> so right. You'll live with it. So <laughs> they're yeah, it it truly is an unbelievably talented team. Uh, look, Cup Finals is a different beast. We're not there yet, but this team is is something special. I think the word, and again, I'm the one that's most recent on this, but I would say skilled. I think yeah. all of this, we're kind of getting at the same thing. When yeah. you watch them, they kind of, there's no perfect, when you cross sports, there's no perfect one, but they kind of are the Warriors, I would say, of this, it, like the Golden State Warriors, and that they play this like, brand of hockey that just seems more skillful than most teams yes. where maybe some teams are tougher or stronger or, you know uh, you know whatever have a goalie that is just like insane or something but the as just skate faster they shoot they handle the puck a little bit cleaner and they shoot it in ways that are more interesting and stuff so they're very like dynamic and skilled team i would say yeah i love that you mentioned the warriors because um they do this thing that i've really rarely ever seen in hockey which is for lack of a better term, the actual avalanche. Where all <laughs> of the so sudden, I love yeah. it when actually where you're right. There is a like, lot of it. All of the sudden, goals. you are covered by them, yeah. and there's nowhere for you to go, and they're just pouring pucks in the net. Like they've done it multiple times in this playoffs. They did it a lot in the regular season, where like you just blink and they've scored three goals. That to me is so foreign to hockey. Right. Right? To see teams just pounce like that. Are Makar and Taves the splash bros of hockey? <laughs> is that? <laughs> Is that where we're at? <laughs> is it because they shoot from further back? Yeah, is that yeah, the idea? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Distance range. Uh, I love that people are bringing up. Who was it that called them bland? Uh, Wyshynski. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the funny thing about that, and it is a little bit of a fear for me. The reason that people called them bland or boring is because they haven't really dealt with drama. Yeah, they've just been really good. <laughs> they've just been good. And even in this playoffs, you know, you get. I guess the. Losing the game to the Blues after the McKinnon goal was the true time that they've been tested. 
Um, but even right. then, it, there wasn't that much drama. So now it's like the only fear for me, and I'll touch wood on this, is like, what if they trail in the series? Like, they how have do they ex- respond? They you're just, saying, yeah. Ha- yeah, like that. That is the the bland or boring thing about the Avalanche. It's never watching them play hockey. That's always electric. <laughs> But it's the fact that they, they don't really have storylines. Like, they've got the goalie thing going now. That's a little bit of a storyline. But the storyline is just, holy shit, this team is awesome. <laughs> and the thing is, like, even if they do end up trailing, mentally this team has just been so steady this year that they nothing has phased them top to bottom. And yep. I don't think anything will. They could be down 3-1 and, you know, again, hope they won't. But... I think they would go into it, and they've spent these whole playoffs saying, look, win the next game. We're not thinking about whatever. Every night we're 0-0 zero and zero trying to go 1-0. and zero. Right. So, um, Let's go real quickly through some of the key players. I mean, Nathan McKinnon would be the guy I think yeah. you would start with. I mean, there's two guys you could start with, Kel McCarr being the other one. Let's start with Nathan McKinnon. I think, you know, the first sort of superstar in. Would he give us the uh, bandwagoner's guide to Nathan McKinnon? Nathan McKinnon is a bull in a china shop. He is <laughs> top three skater in the league probably alongside Kale McCarr uh, and Connor McDavid who they just beat so absolutely one of the best skaters in the world but it's not just speed it's power with his game mm. he has the ability to just put his head down and go through people if he wants to obviously he has the whole toolkit he can stick handle in a phone booth he can rip pucks top corner one time or backhand anything you ask of the guy he is truly an all-world talent but what separates him is he has the mj factor he will go into practice and he will scream at his teammates Mm. until they do it right he demands excellence not only from everyone around him but more than anyone he demands excellence from himself so there's a thin line on this mamba mentality or whatever and that that, like you go a little too far on that it's almost petulant like it's almost like it it borders on that sometimes for sure so does he cross that though is this a thing where he's kind of mj sort of had this and he won so we never had to question it kobe like had this for a while where it wasn't effective and it was like detrimental is he where is he at on that line would you say i in the moment, I do think he can he can push that line, too maybe far. even cross it a little yeah. bit. But there's two factors there. One, when practice is over in the locker room, he'll always come back and be like, "Hey, my bad." <laughs> Almost like Hulk, like he's like it goes yeah, away. Yeah, from exactly. him. He's like, oh. Dude just blacks out yeah, and is yeah. like, "Oh, okay, maybe push you that, see that too Marvel far." Marvel reference I just made. Nice. Yeah, God, and Three. credit, but mark that down. <laughs> and two. The Avs' leadership core is built extremely well. There's a reason Nathan McKinnon is not the captain of this team. That's Gabe Landeskog because Landy is a little bit easier going than McKinnon. He understands that sometimes the team has to have a little bit of fun instead of just pure focus dominance all the time because he knows that'll burn guys out. Right. It's an interesting comp. Um, for me with Peyton Manning because he was the same way. Yeah. And Peyton was fun though too. He. Yes. He, he has a personality, but. There is a there is an amount of it that a team can handle. Yeah, for sure. And if you talk to people about the Broncos 2015 run, that was, you know, the end of the Peyton Manning era, and they'll tell you when he was injured right, in that right. in that little um pocket during the season, the team kind of like needed a break right, from him. Right. And they got it. And then when he came back, everyone was like refreshed and ready to go. Um with Mac, you know, there's stories that uh, if you pass to him in practice and it's not on the tape, he doesn't even reach a stick out. And he's like, do it again. Yep. And run it back. So, like, that could definitely wear you out. But when you're winning like this, and I I love the way the leadership is set up because you can, like, go to Landy if yeah. Mac is pissing you yeah. off, you know. Um, when you're winning like this, everyone just gets on board and just says, like, push through. Yep. What he says goes until we lift the cup. Yep. That's yeah. exactly right. Winning solves any issue anyone might have. So. I think this is Brandon Katz has been in the comments like a, a bunch of times. I there's a, this is one of my favorite TikToks. Is there's this like one that says like guy who's incapable of having fun, and he's looking <laughs> out at a beautiful ocean. And he's like, "He fell in that, you'd be dead." <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's your comment. Sometimes I feel like that. I look, like, Brandon. I'm kind of picking on you here, but like this is how I've been. Like some of like, the West is weak. This or that. I'm like, guys, this comes along so rarely that you get to choose how you engage with it. Like if that's the only way, the only perspective you want to take on it, like by, by all means run, we got 10 days. Like every, every angle of this is going to be covered, including mm-hmm. maybe, you know, have they been tested enough for this or that? But there's another part of this, which is like one day we're all going to grow old and die. 
And we're going to look back and like, we're going to like look back at these moments fondly. I'm pretty confident of that. We're going to look back and be like, man, that team was awesome. That was this or that. And try to enjoy it. Try to stay present it's, at the moment, I think, and enjoy these. One thing in hockey culture that does happen quite a bit in the fan base is they're really good at hating themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> they're really good at it. Of they course. will find reasons to tie themselves into knots on why yeah. things are going to go the wrong way and it's not going to happen. Right. And I, I love what you said because right now when you experience things like this, do the same thing the Avs are doing. Right. Live in the moment. Don't think about game two. You're thinking about the next game that they play and how dope it's going to be. Yeah. Yep. Um, I th- I, Go ahead. And I, I think this is why I have this like um, uh, emotional protection of like, I don't want to know too much. It's like right now, I think this, I, I was thinking about this the other day. This is the most fun I've ever had watching sports ever yeah. is watching this abs run. And it's because I'm not thinking about like, well, is Obey Kubel like enough <laughs> yeah. to get them over? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I I'm know, just, I know I'm just turning it on and being like, Fuck yeah. Yeah, this, and it's this fun. rules. It's fun. Be present for it. Uh, let's take a break on the other side. We're going to talk about Kale McCarr and some of the other guys, their personalities, as well as how we got here and what's up ahead. But first, RK. Mm. <laughs> did you not um, know I was throwing you there? Let me you gave see. a look. No, like, I, I, I did. I did my work. Uh, I got to give a shout out to Ivaca TV, which, by the way, no better time than now to be talking about Ivaca TV because I think, well, okay, I don't want to go on too much of a rant here, but. I feel like we're not getting as much Avs fever as we could. Mm. And I think part of it is because of the fact that it hasn't been on TV. And so some people have like no exposure right. until right now. Right. Whereas I think if the team was on TV, people would have heard more about how good they were during the season and maybe like, oh, these are the cup favorites and turned on a couple games and maybe it would have helped. Anyways, Ivaca TV is solving that issue by allowing you to watch the Nuggets, watch the Avs, watch the Rockies all on your tv super affordable you know we've talked about this a lot but um the boston regional sports network just recently came out and they're like we're gonna allow you to watch these for 30 bucks a month like you'll just have and like i'm just you like get two sports teams for 30 bucks yeah. a month. two teams avaca tv you get that plus you get all of the additional programming like a normal streaming service for 25 bucks a month plus you get ten dollars off when you use the code dnvr so go to avaca.tv slash dnvr check out what they have to offer there also Head over to our friends at DraftKings Sportsbook, where the Avs are now minus 220 favorites. Wow. To win the Stanley Cup. That's DraftKings wild. is saying, we don't care who they play. Wow. That's wild. They are the heavy favorites. Too, wow. Um, so check that out. Uh, you're s- still probably not too late. I, in the beginning of the first series, I gave out Kale McCarr for Con Smythe. And I said that if you're going to bet on the ass to win the Stanley Cup, you might as well just bet on this. You'll get better value. It's That's down bet. to plus 170. It was plus 650 at the time. Still a good bet. Still a good bet. Uh, so check out DraftKings Sportsbook. Also, you can bet $5 on any NBA Finals game. Get $150 in free bets when you do so. So shout out DraftKings. The old con Smythe. Uh, back here, segment two of the Denver Sports Podcast. We're presented, as always, by Breckenridge Brewery. In particular, the... Avalanche Amber Ale. What better hey, beer to drink than that? The, imagine that. <laughs> Is it a coincidence? Probably not. Um, Kel McCarr. My personal favorite av. Yeah. It, I'm, I risk potentially overstating this, but these playoffs, you may genuinely be watching Kale McCarr become the best hockey player in the world. Woo! Yeah. Spicy Rudo. Like I'm, I'm not. I feel like he went like, up against Connor McDavid. Yeah, he held his own. Look up to me, like as a dummy who doesn't know hockey. I was like, oh, well, he even to me, one not better. Matchup. Yeah, probably won the matchup. It is the first defenseman ever to have multiple series in the playoffs where they sco- average over two points per game that are both sweeps. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, watching Kale is like nothing else. And and I remember doing like a TDSP. In his the season after his playoff burst, so I guess his rookie season, and just being like, this dude looks different. Yep. And again, that's one of those things where it's like you turn on the abs, you see it. Like Kale McCarr, the way that he looks on the ice, there's just no one else who moves the way that he moves. It's yeah. and it's such a nice piece to have next to Nathan McKinnon. Nathan McKinnon is is very loud. He's very. This is how you want to do this. Do this correct. Do that. Kale McCarr is. I'm going to shut up and watch me work because he just goes out there and is better than you. Like, yeah. he, he's not worried about talking. He's out there 
and, and honestly, one of the most modest players on the team, will make you shut up if you try to say a good word about him. And he, he things he does, the, the moment it really, really clicked for me is Blaze, who was on our DNVR Avs pod, told me he goes to his kids' practices. Kids are doing the, the Mohawk move at the blue line. He goes, well, why do you do that? I don't know, because Kale McCarr does it. Mm-hmm. What's the Mohawk move? Uh, so it's when you put your feet opposite ways. I can't do it because I'm not an, oh. an, an, an yeah, NHL yeah, yeah. athlete. Incredible flexibility yeah, in a weird yeah, way. Yeah. Ankle flexibility. <laughs> huh. And it it dawned on me that Kale McCarr, one, is doing things literally no one else is doing, and two, is creating a generation of new hockey players that are imitating him. Yep. Interesting. And that's when you're transcending a level that I can't even comprehend at that point. So yeah, I mean, you talk about the Splash Brothers, like yeah. <laughs> Steph Curry has every kid in America shooting from twelve feet behind the exactly. Point line. I for the reason I like him again as a guy that doesn't really know the strategy of hockey is that to me I can't take my eyes off him when he's on the ice. Like he because he does so many things. Like Nathan McKinnon, he gets the puck. It's like incredible. It's like it's shot of adrenaline. Yeah. when he gets it. But with Kale McCarr, almost at all times, I'm kind of watching him just because. Sometimes he'll like skate from one end to the other, catch up to somebody, just steal the puck from him, and you're just kind of like, man, that was amazing. Then he'll come over, race through a couple guys, and make a great pass. It's just he does the the number of different things he does. I I he's the only hockey player where I I seem to be watching him rather than the game. Sure, sometimes. sure. Yeah. It's crazy because he is so good offensively that he could be a top forward in the NHL. And that's where I think, like, like when you said we should start with McKinnon, I was about to say, I think you should start with McCarr. <laughs> this might be the year. Where right, he... because it's like he's so good on offense and then also yeah. the best defender. And it's just, you know, I was when you were talking about Nathan McKinnon, I was thinking, like, who is his NFL comp? And I, and I think it's like Adrian Peterson. Like fast, yeah. powerful. Explosive, explosive, like the plays are big. Yes. They're maybe fewer, but they're bigger. There's just simply not an NFL comp for Kale McCarr because he plays both sides. Yeah, I and mean, football is he's yeah, too yeah, good yeah. on on both sides for there to even be a comparison for him. It's it's incredible because people who watch him every night know that there really isn't a hole in his game. A lot of the national media tries to put a knock on him that he's not that physical, and it's just not true. Yeah. He will run dudes over if given the opportunity. His face makes him seem not physical. Yeah, true. Well, that's, we, but this is part of the his story. His weakness is his playoff beard, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but this is actually part of the story with Kale McCarr that I think is so interesting. Like when we're talking about hopping on a bandwagon, why are these guys cool? It's both in, we're talking about the skill set, but also sort of the personality and the different details about him. Of all great athletes in all sports, I'm not talking about Denver. Of all great athletes in all great sports, I think he might be the most boyish looking. Like if you just saw a picture, if I just put a picture up of him and was like, this is the baddest dude in the planet, <laughs> you'd be like, no, he's not. Well, it's it's pretty hilarious to to take a picture of him and his rosy cheeks, and you'd be like, all right, this kid's almost 23 now, I think. And then you take a picture of Alex Newhook with full beard, full grown out, looks like a, a hobo, and it's like, yeah, that dude's three years younger than Kale McCarr on this hockey team. Uh, it, it it is it, it is funny how that has been built up as as Kale McCarr just looks eternally young. I hope it stays that way. Yeah. I, I hope it never changes. I hope he's 35 still playing for this team and he still has the rosy cheeks and, and looks like he I just mean, I joined think the he league. Will. I don't think that's like a thing that's going to change. <clears throat> What's interesting is I, th- I think there's a little bit of Jokic going on there where you talk about people talking about him not being physical. It's just they yeah. just look at him and they're like, he's not a badass hockey player. <laughs> right. Not. Meanwhile, he's skating circles around everyone. He is physical. He's strong. He's all You, you know, things. it's funny. What, the, nobody says that about Yoke anymore. And they it's been a couple years coming, but I think one of the reasons was he literally took out a guy for like five months. And I, I, <laughs> Sometimes like one event will be like, oh, God, that's the, that, that's what he is. Um, so the chemical car, is there anybody else that you think deserves sort of a special hotline? Because there's a lot of good players, but is there another specific one? Uh, you have to talk about Miko Rantanen. There are three players on this team that I truly believe could be on a Hall of Fame path right now, and he's one of the three with McKinnon and McCarr, of course. Has he had an underwhelming playoffs? Oh, this is a secret. Z- yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a complex. Is it like guys conversation. like me say that, but guys like you realize more? Miko Rantanen this year is like Jokic when he's being lazy. 
Okay. He pre MVP season. Yeah. <laughs> Still ex- an extremely extremely good hockey player. He's 24, 25. Oh, so he's his the best years are ahead Still of him. Still the coach. Okay. Yeah. I'll say this. The weird thing about um Miko is that even when he was isn't playing well, he produces. Yeah, they, look, the dude is an unbelievable hockey player. You happens regularly, like, wow, Miko really didn't play that well tonight. Oh, he had a three point night. Okay, okay. I guess <laughs> whatever. But but the thing with Miko is, you know, there's more there with that guy. He's he's one of the best players at his position in the world. Well, walk me through what that means real quick with Ranton. Because honestly, I've, the other guys I have like feel like I really know their games now at Ranton, and I don't. So what is he good at? What what makes him special? I mean, Miko is good at everything offensively. His defensive game is admittedly a bit lacking, and that's always going to be the case. But that's fine because he arguably has a top 10 one-timer in the league. He's arguably a top 10 passing winger in the league. He probably has a top three backhand in the league. But he's a dude who's 6'3", 220, and on some nights just decides that he wants to play like he's 5'10", 180. Mm. He just... And and it's frustrating because we've seen in the past, he knows how to play big. He can do it. But a lot of nights he says, I'm not going to put my body on the line for this. So he can be extremely frustrating because you know there's more there. But that's not to take anything away from the guy. The dude is well over a point per game player. What has so, his, what has his trajectory been like over the last couple seasons? Uh so the two seasons previous to this one were just directly up. He started playing physical and everyone was like, "Oh my god, this kid might actually Having be his breakout. Yeah. He was leading the league in points for or Yeah, for most, most of, of the season, the yeah. 2021 season, he was leading the league in points. It was ridiculous. And this year he still played unbelievably well. He's still producing all of that, but the way he's gotten it done has been less dominant. So this happens sometimes in basketball when, when you have too talented of a team, one player sort of just naturally has to take a backseat. Is there any of that going on? Do you think? Um, hmm. Yes and no. Uh, I think he thinks he needs to be taking a backseat. And we've seen that, especially in these playoffs with the reduction of his willingness to shoot the hockey puck. Mm. Um, and and everyone who watches the Avs a lot is begging him, especially when it comes to power plays. Miko, shoot the puck. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're a good enough shooter that he needs to be shooting the puck more. And it's look, it's a great position to be in. You're annoyed that Miko isn't playing the way he could be, but he's still playing more than well enough to get what the Avs need out of him. So, I. At this point, especially, I'm just going to take it for what it is and enjoy it. <laughs> Here, here's the other thing. He scored in every game yeah. in the Edmonton series. He scored a goal in and every game. One of those was an empty netter, to be fair. Fair. But that, that's what got him kind of going, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is, when looking at the con Smythe, it's McCarr the favorite, McKinnon second, Miko's fifth yep. of, of all the players remaining. So, like, he... It's so weird because it does feel like, like you want more from him. You want more from him. And meanwhile, he's, he's one of the five best yeah, players left in the playoffs. He's still out there dominating. It's it's just not in the way that we've seen in the past couple of years. And it, people will get frustrated with it. But honestly, that's fine. Again, you have McKinnon. I'm sure we won't talk about him as much. But you have Landis Gog. You have other guys down the lineup that are scoring plenty. That are, that are doing the physical aspects that Miko isn't. So... Do the Avs miss it? Not really. <laughs> okay. What would be the ideal, though? I mean, for this team, would it be that he sort of has his best series and that it, it doesn't take away? Like, you don't you don't feel like him being more aggressive takes away from McKinnon, no. McCarr, mm-hmm. Landis, Gog, all these guys? Not at all. It's And we saw Edmonton do this. Um, Nathan McKinnon is going to get basically straight up double teamed all the way through the, this cup finals teams are going to say if Miko beats us, he beats us, but we're not letting Nathan McKinnon beat us. And McKinnon will still beat you anyway sometimes, but if Miko steps up, I don't know how you stop the abs top players. It's the one thing that I really noticed between McKinnon and McDavid is that when you try to do that to McDavid, he just gets a guy, another guy to tap in. Yep. And it's like the one thing that I'm like, man, because Mac tries. Yep. He wants to be unselfish. Yep. And sometimes it's actually 
his undoing. Like the biggest mistakes you'll yeah. ever see Nathan McKinnon make is when he's trying to be unselfish. Watch him pull up against the half wall, <laughs> yeah. try to throw a puck through three dudes, and it goes the other way. And you're like, Mac, mm, just go to the net, bud. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one thing. If if he had that that level of passing, there would be nothing you could do to him. And he's capable of it. You just don't see him flash it consistently. But like that's like something if he, for some reason had an amazing passing series while they're trying to take him away in this cup final and Miko's going to score a bunch of goals on the other side. I want to keep this moving though. If we take a step back and kind of look at the over the bigger arc of the, uh, of this whole timeline, where would you, um, is this a five year? Did this start five years ago, six years ago, three years ago? Where, where, where does this story begin? Yeah. I mean, it started at the end of the 2016, 17 season when the abs were the worst hockey team in modern history, uh, in, in the regular season. It, it was the lowest point this franchise has ever been. And they immediately turned it around and made the playoffs next year because there's a level of flukiness that goes to, into being the worst team in modern history. But Nathan McKinnon finally broke out the next year, and that was really the catalyst that shot the Avalanche back into, okay, they're a real hockey team. They can be competitive. Uh, and that was the beginning, and then the upswing was... From the 16-17 season, they drafted Kale McCarr. He joins them in their second year. Miko Rantanen comes into his own, and it was sky is the limit from so there. So McKinnon is one, and Rantanen sort of alongside him? Is this- uh, so McKinnon had been there for a while, but his breakout came. Because they drafted him super, super young, right? Yeah. That, in hockey, that's how it yeah, works. First overall, it was in the league at 18 immediately. Yeah. And, and it, there are multiple factors there with McKinnon's Rise to prominence also came the Matt Duchesne trade, which is arguably the second biggest trade in the history of this hockey team. The only bigger one being the Patrick Waugh trade. Um, And the combination of McKinnon coming up, Miko finding his stride, and then the third nail in the coffin of Kale McCarr coming in and being the guy everyone thought he could be essentially took the abs to a cup competitor level did those guys have all of them have a a lot of like hype coming in i mean mckinnon being a number one pick i have to assume but mckinnon had a ton of hype around him rantanen was picked to 10th overall he was a guy that was expected to make the jump to the nhl very quickly but no one put his ceiling at the level that he's reached so he was more ready than he was upside correct And then Makar is a little bit all over the place. There are a bunch of questions about him, but everyone said, yeah, this is the dude with the highest ceiling that we've ever seen. I don't, so. not knowing anything about hockey culture, I have to imagine there's some bias because I think football and hockey are the most like, you know, like we're tough or whatever. And if you just look at this dude, I imagine when you look at him at like 18 years old, you're like, man, I don't know. This is not a, this guy's not cut out for the toughness of the NHL. But then like you see the highlight that went re-viral yesterday. Yeah, I think of just him running in, that poor junior? kid over. Junior A. Yeah, yeah. he's a playing junior. He's behind the net. A dude tries to come check him. He reverse checks him, puts him on his ass, takes the puck, goes around, scores a backhand. Like that at least gives you some confidence you, that he can handle but here's the thing. Do you remember the seed in Moneyball? Did you guys ever watch that movie, Moneyball yeah. baseball movie, when they're talking about, like, he has no confidence, his girlfriend's ugly or whatever, like, and this is, like, how the scouts operate oh, for some yeah, reason? 100%. I just Like, baseball, that's all about how that got pushed out. But I do feel like with football in particular, and maybe this is true of hockey, too, there's still guys out there that are like, his girlfriend's ugly, he has no confidence. And you're like, what? Totally. What are we it, talking about? <laughs> you know, it, it is interesting. Makar has kind of been at the forefront of a new wave of hockey scouting where these smaller, yeah. I say smaller, but he's bigger than I am. And I'm like an average human. Uh, they're getting more and more popular in the NHL scene. You go back to 2010 and earlier. And if you were a defenseman that was under six to 215, like you just didn't get drafted. And like, it wasn't even people yeah. didn't even think about you. So he really has been at the forefront of changing, not just, what people do on the ice and how you view the game, but the culture of the sport as well. One last thing on Kale McCarr is the Avs got screwed into Kale McCarr. Yeah, they had to lose the draft lottery to end up with Kale. Who McCarr. do they want to take? Uh, they were like, who did everybody want to take? Uh, so it was there were two players that year at the the top of the Avs board was Nolan Patrick. They would have taken him at one, and then Nico Hishier was the other one. And both of them, well, Hishier is a solid player, fifty point guy in the NHL. Nolan Patrick has been injured his entire NHL career Oof. and has never really made it work. So it worked out for the Avs. Yes. Wow. You have to get a little lucky to end up this good. 
Uh, I want to bring in now Yahir, uh, super producer Yahir is on the ones and twos back there behind the scene. Who, Yahir, I under, I know that you've been a hockey fan for six years now, I think it is, since the Duchesne trade you were saying. That's the first time I ever heard about hockey, if I'm honest. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the first time <laughs> where I'm like, like that's, that, that was like the you time. You hadn't even heard of it? Like, this is like, how I am with, like, lacrosse and stuff. Like, all of a sudden, it was a sport, and I'm like, I never even knew this <laughs> thing. Well, like, I knew about the championships. I knew about Osaka, but I never yeah. paid attention. Uh, I heard... I started, like, getting into it when I heard on the radio, Duchesne wants to get traded. I'm like, who the hell is Duchesne? He sounds douchey as fuck. Why doesn't he want to be here? <laughs> so I'm like, like, that's when I knew them. Like, that's when I started getting into hockey. That's when I heard the first about the avalanche, but I didn't truly get into hockey up until this uh, this year. So this year, because you got sort of assigned to being the Avs producer, it was like you you had no choice. Actually, I shouldn't say you have no choice because I imagine that there are different shows you could produce that you're like, man, that's a bummer or whatever. <laughs> but the Avs are just like so rewarding. I mean, at what point, what was the best record they were at? It So were they like 50 and 10 or something at one point, 50 and 8? Uh, so they went... Four, five, and one to start the season. They actually started off very slow, and then they didn't lose another six games until they were, I believe, thirty-nine, oh, eight, geez. and two. I believe at so. that point, if you're covering this every game the way you were, like maybe if you were just out and about and you know not working this job, maybe you weren't watching every game. But when you were like, okay, I'm watching every single game. When you win. Almost every single night, when you win five times a week and lose once a week, it's like it's hard not to be like, man, this is fun. We just it's so rewarding. I'm so spoiled because by the t- <laughs> when this is all over, let's say it's ten years down the road, the Avalanche have three three chips or whatever, yeah. and then we go back into a rebuild. Yeah. I'm not gonna know how to react. I'm not know how. I don't know how what bad <laughs> hockey looks like. I look at the Eastern Conference Finals and I'm like, this is not the same. Like it's like <laughs> JV compared to um. Wow, to varsity, talking spicy man. Well, like, you sound like Rudo. Well, like the, the reason is because like the Avalanche are just so fast. They're yeah. so aware of what they do. AJ says it all the time. I'm nitpicking, but this team is just so good. I have to nitpick to find the bad in this team. Yeah. And when I look at like even the Tampa Bay, like they look slow. They want to grind it out. It's not fun hockey. It's winning hockey, but it's not fun hockey. Once you actually see the Avalanche play, they're fun and winning. Right. And they win in every single way. It's just you'll never get over it. Like It's an experience every single time. So here's an interesting question for you because I think one of the barriers of entry for hockey for like a person that hasn't gotten in is you think maybe it's too confusing. Like There's all these different rules or this or that. Me just watching this, and it's not like I don't know how hockey works, but maybe some of the subtleties of it or whatever. I I think it's actually remarkably easy to get into. I I think it's there's there's depths you can go to, of course, where yep. you're getting the nuance. But in terms of just like can you watch – one or two playoff hockey. You get in the Stanley Cup Finals. You watch one or two games. I think by the end of game two, you're going to pretty much know what the teams are in a broad sense trying to do, you know, and follow the game. On You're not going to be lost. There is a thing we talk about a lot where it's like, would you show this hockey game to a new fan? Right. And how that works is if you get into a hockey game where there's a bunch of whistles and yeah, the game yeah. doesn't have any pace and all of that, you're like, uh, look, I get it. This could be confusing. This isn't exactly the best. But then you get five straight minutes without a whistle, and people go, oh, okay. Right. I understand now what this is about, what a hockey game actually looks like. And you don't need to know all the rules to love hockey. When you just see players going up and down the ice at the pace that they go, at the speed this game is played, it, I'm a biased source, obviously, but I don't know how you can't fall in love with well, it. Well, part of what I like about it is, I mean, I'm going to reduce you. This is the thing you're going to be annoyed at, but maybe the newcomers will kind of appreciate. Hockey to me is like you're trying to get it in your zone, and then you're trying to score once you have it in your zone. And that's kind of the battle. There's always that battle going on of like, okay, we got it there and we got set up. Now we're trying to work an angle. We shoot it, rebound it, make sure we don't lose it. Then there's the defenses get it out of the zone, <laughs> and then it's fight for possession, back in the zone now, and it's just kind of back and forth with that. It, yeah, I think that's part of what makes hockey special is possession is almost entirely undefined in this sport. At any yeah. moment, it's just you don't have the puck anymore. It, it's going the other way. So You could define it almost as if do you have all five guys in the zone because that means you're in the zone and in control of it, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always talk about these little things that um, that I'm, it always blows my mind how perfect certain things are in sports. 
Like, I think it's wild how 10 yards is the perfect amount. Like, it's yeah. the perfect amount of difficulty to get yeah. 10 yards to create a great sport in football. One thing that's perfect about hockey is somehow you always get rewarded for dominating ha- having the puck in your zone. Right. Yep. Like, it's... I don't, I, I don't, it's just weird how, like, there's obviously once in a while you could dominate a whole game, have the puck in the zone the whole time you lose, but nine times out of ten, when a team, you can feel when but a team this, is about to score, but even is, if you're just turning it on. This is what's cool about the Avs, but it's the one thing that gives me a little bit of concern about the finals is I felt like watching last year, the Avs just had the puck at all the time. They just <laughs> always had it. And then one game it stopped, and they never got it back, I felt like. And that was the thing where I was just kind of like, Watching round one, the sweep, and even watching game one against Vegas, I was like, man, they're going to win because they always have the puck. And then all of a sudden, they never got it back. <laughs> yeah. And it, look, anything can happen, right? Yeah. It, it's possible that it happens again. But again, I go back to this team. They've so consistently been able to, if something throws off their game, they've been able to get back to it this year. Yeah. They've, they've found ways to f- play not even necessarily the game they want to play, but they'll beat you however the opponent wants to play the game. They're just so solid in their fundamentals that they can do anything that they want to do. And honestly, in the cup finals, you should be a little bit nervous. Right? There should be at least some nervous energy going on there because yeah. this is what it's all about. Right. This is what you show up for. These are the great moments that happen in sports. Obviously, you hope it goes your way, but there's a very real chance that it might not. Right. Right. You know, the the scary part about the finals is you're going to go up against an insanely yeah, good goalie. The other best team in the league. But so. but also just the one thing that you haven't really faced so far in these playoffs is a true elite goaltender. An elite yeah. goaltender and that's, you know, that's the classic offense versus defense kind of conversation. Because in hockey, goals are so low, like even a high-scoring game is seven goals, that the variance goes up inevitably because you could have a great shot that just a lucky save changes the entire complexion of the game. Um, that's that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Who's your favorite Avs player? That's the issue. They're also <laughs> likable. Like, literally, like, anybody that comes into this team is extremely likable. You have Josh Manson that came in, like, half season, and I'm, like, a big Josh Manson guy. But then I look at I look you're, you're at Nuke. So deep in the game, man. dude. I am like I even bought NHL 2022 and I've been playing that constantly for like the last two months. I like, too have downloaded that game. It's just, just like try to fill the gaps. Is that a good way game. to learn the game? To it's, learn the team? Or no, it's a horrible way to learn. It. It's not accurate at all. But I think it has to be Nuke, just because of his goal chain. Wow. Nuke wow. is super fun. He's likable and he's just yeah, a hard worker. The gold chains. All yeah. Right. Good to know. I'm a gold chain kind of guy. Open hair, a little bit of hair, uh, chest hair. Um, we're walking around with the tracksuit. That's what I picture Nuke on an off day. Write down some wedding presents real quick. Nuke yep. is <laughs> the Andrew Wiggins of the Avs. Okay. High draft pick, high expectations, didn't work out elsewhere. You take him and put him on an awesome team, and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, that guy is really good. He's like, yeah, he's butting into a role. I like that. That's a good, uh, that's a good one. Do you have a favorite, like a guy that you kind of just lean towards? Um, I mean, Kale McCarr is just too good to not be your favorite. But uh, beyond that, especially this year, how can you not love Nazem Kadri? Mm. That, he's my second guy for sure. Talk about him just real quickly. Uh, so Kadri's an interesting one because his entire career, he's been an extremely good hockey player, but had never quite made it to that proper superstar level. Could never really be the guy on a hockey team. He came here and has been solid for a couple of years, and then this year has had the best year of his career by a How mile. Old is he? he is thirty-one, so he's he's over the mm-hmm. like. Yeah, arc he's of his career. he's on the downswing for yeah. sure. It, despite this being the best <laughs> year of yeah. his career, for on the aging curve, he's on the downswing. It, it's incredibly unlikely that he repeats the performance he had this year. Uh, and you know, obviously, especially in these playoffs, out, outside factors has made things even more ridiculous for what's going on around Kadri. And he's been a guy that the Avs community has really rallied around. Um, in, a, in a tough spot, had surgery on his thumb uh, due to the Evander Kane hit in Game 3 of the Conference Finals, but it sounds like he could be back for some games in the Finals. I'm, uh, Strez in the comments said Game 3. I'm calling Game 1. It, it Look, it's not off the board. I'll put it that way. Yep. Game one is not off the board. I'm I'm not going to guarantee it, and obviously how it goes with his recovery, we'll see. But that him 
and Eric Johnson are the two guys that the team has really ran rounded around, circled around. Yeah. Uh, that it's like, do it for these guys. Do you have a favorite? A favorite player? Yeah. Kale, for sure. Really? Um, Is this new? Like, if I did this <laughs> poll a year ago, wouldn't it have been mostly McKinnon? I'd have said Miko a year ago. Okay. I would have said Kale a year ago. Okay. Um, I just feel like Kale's Q score is just like I unbelievable just, it's, it's, right now. <laughs> the way it just watching, I said it literally like 10 games into his career. I'm like, watching him play is so aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, I agree. It's so I agree. easy to watch. Yeah. Um, so for me, that's it. And then in terms of like a secondary kind of star, man, it's hard to go against Kadri. Yep. No. So I thought I was unique and maybe Taves. basic. Taves is, Taves is probably the other correct okay. answer, yeah. I would say. <laughs> well, I like this. I think people have a good sense of the bandwagon. So we've talked about what the guys on the team. We talked about how they got here, both the small picture and the big picture. The one thing I'm curious about to kind of end this is where's this team going? And I don't mean the Stanley Cup. We've talked about that as well and the sort of them being favorites. But is this – are they – I know you can never look around the corner too far. But is this a team that uh, feels like they are set up for long-term success with these guys? Windows as open as it's ever going to be. Uh, th- all they have to do is is jump through the thing, basically. They have Kale locked up forever. They have Gabe Landeskog locked up forever. They have Miko Rantanen locked up forever. McKinnon only has two years, well, really one year left on his deal as of July 13th. Meaning uh, next season? Yeah, but the Avs will literally give that guy a blank check to keep him. So not really worried about it. Okay. Uh so the entire core of this team is going to be here for the foreseeable future. And some of the moving parts are going to have to change. Kadri very likely gone after this year. But it, the foreseeable future is this team is a cup contender indefinitely. I forgot my real favorite secondary player, which is LOC. Um, <laughs> With the Loch Ness Monster down like that. Yes, exactly. Um, one thing I guess to remember is Kadri likely not back next year although i'm predicting that he does um he just wants to stay in denver that's my just the fan in me um probably not going to st louis mckinnon has been on an (laughs) (laughs) mckinnon has been on an insanely cheap deal um like every series there's some comparison just like what was it darnell nurse is making twice as much money as him in this last series (laughs) not quite twice as much okay significantly Um, more yeah like so there are a couple of those little things where you point and you're like, if you get one now, you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. For sure. Whereas if you do, if you don't, we'll touch wood, <laughs> then you're starting to think, okay, well, you're not going to have as much money for this. He might not be back. So the window is as, op- is as open now as it could ever be. Yep. Agreed. Is there any concern at all about, you know, the ownership of this group, the Cronkies, like being willing to... None. Okay. They... They want to win. They have always going. been willing to spend as much money as is necessary for the abs. And, and it's easy in hockey. There's a hard salary cap that is relatively low compared to the other leagues. It, it's not a ton of money out of their pocket to do it for the abs. So they've never been an issue. They've never been meddling. They just sign the checks. They say whatever you need, and the abs go. And I, if Joe Sackick doesn't win GM of the year this year, I, we riot, I guess. What's that one They're called? too good. Uh, it's just called the team of the year. You don't have a name after it? No. <laughs> Maybe one day it'll be the Sackick. <laughs> Sackick <laughs> Award. They uh, never want to give credit to the, t- the, the team with the yeah, best players. the actually Even best. Even though he's the one who got <laughs> right, them the right, best right. players. <laughs> it's always a one-year, same in basketball, it's always right. a one-year award when you're like, most teams didn't get built in one year. They got yeah. built over several. Um, the guys, this was great. I hope everybody now has the guide to becoming a bandwagon. I know a lot of people, probably most of the people watching this already are, but if you're not, I'm telling you, if you guys came here for me or you came here for RK for Broncos or this or that, and you're kind of wondering, I'm telling you, the Avs are a very rewarding team, not just because they win, but because they really are so fun. Like, it's, it is a tough sell sometimes. The 2016 Broncos won a Super Bowl. They're the most boring team I ever watched in my life. I, I, would have, I would have had a hard time selling those to certain people. Sometimes you have fun and win. Sometimes you have boring and win. This team is fun, man, and uh, you make the time investments. going to be fun. And then best of all, I don't know if you guys heard the news, but we've had a packed dnvr bar for every single game and what's been cool is you kind of watch as it goes further it gets more packed and more mm. intense and more awesome and for the stanley cup finals my god i 
we are going to have the best parties we've ever thrown. We have some big plans up our sleeve. So if you're thinking about jumping on the bandwagon, check out the DNVR Avalanche podcast and set your calendars to be here at the DNVR bar for game one, which looks like it'll be a week from Saturday. We'll keep you posted on that. One thing I want to say is one thing I'm really proud of, of what we've built here is the type of people that come around here yeah. and that are part of this Avs community. And so if you are jumping on the bandwagon and you're worried, oh, I don't know, I don't want to go to, you know, hang out about a bunch of Avs fans and feel like an idiot. People here will take you under their wing, will accept you, will oh, yeah. answer your question if you just turn to someone at a, you know, a table next to you and say, "Hey, what was that call?" You know, they'll happily explain it to you and I think that's a a really cool and uh and special thing. Man, we've we've had so much of that where people come to the bar and then they become like Twitter friends or something, you know, like where it's yeah. oh they're Twitter friends and then they meet at the bar. Like yeah. that's that's the thing of, that was our vision for the bar. In fact, as a lot of people know, we're going through a big renovation in the month of July. So this party is really like a farewell to DNVR bar one point Do a lot of people know that? Do people know maybe they don't. <laughs> it, it's come out well, on we, the Avs we, pod we, once we, or twice. Yeah, it's come out on the Nuggets pod too that we're gonna be doing. But it, that's cool because DNVR bar two point then will kick in after that. And I'm telling you, one of our visions when we decided to open up a bar was we wanted this to be a place for watch parties, check done but we also wanted it to be the place where you just go like starbucks like you're just coming here to do use wi-fi and see who's here and it's like oh there's somebody i've met through twitter or what have you and this is just your hangout and it's not you know obviously during off days we're not concerned with people spending a ton of money we just want you to be here and feel like this is your home it's our home so if you haven't done that yet <laughs> there's literally no better time than next Saturday for game one. Yeah, yeah, great work. Oh, we do have a super chat. Look at that. It comes in from John, and he says, prediction, Kadri will stay. All right, bold choice, man. I'm t I, I just – he's been through a lot in his career. Yeah. And no fan base has loved him and accepted him the way Avs fans have. And I just feel like there's maybe a part of him that says, I want to I stay. The money isn't the same in hockey as it is in the NBA, but I will say there's been a – 10 year 15 year run towards like you know money and change and go to this or that and, to, and then there's this like ricochet back now where guys are realizing like sometimes Quality. less money but where you are is so much more valuable and there's just been so many high profile players that went to the situation they want for the money they want and have been absolutely miserable so yeah. i don't know i know <laughs> hockey the money is way less but you know the only thing is he played so well this season that he, yeah, someone not, is going to be willing to do something they will stupid. do dumb money things yeah. for him absolutely yeah. <laughs> all right everybody hit that like button on the way out we'll see you next time